the introduction short. Okay, just so should I stay here or should I? No, no, I'm fine. So welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a good coffee break. I hope you all talked to a first-time attendee. I all hope you all hired a woman in the meantime. Um, the next speaker um, on the topic of femtosecond laser microsurgery um, is going to be Adela ben -Yaka. She's with the University of Texas at Austin, and she came from Israel, went to Stanford, got her PhD there, then did postdoc at Stanford and Harvard, and is now working with the femtosecond lasers at the University of Texas. And with that, I'll let her talk. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think I'll use this. Is it on? Okay, I like talking and walking, so I will be uh, right here. Um, well, I am delighted to give uh, a talk in this plenary session and in this very exciting uh, meeting and being one of the uh, three uh, female speakers. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and giving me this opportunity and honor to present our work on femtosecond laser microsurgery. Um, so uh, my lab is located in the mechanical engineering department at UT Austin. Um, I have students and postdocs and researchers from various backgrounds, from many different disciplines in, within engineering, electrical, mechanical, biomedical, um, as well and chemical, and as well as the biology, physics, neuroscience. Um, so, and I do have also MD PhD students. So we have a, we have to put a, a team of very interdisciplinary researchers together to achieve our goals in this uh, uh, in my in my research group. Um, that kind of also fits to my background. I was educated as an aerospace engineer because I wanted to become an astronaut. Um, then I started to use lasers and optics to study supersonic flows in my PhD, uh, where I completely fall in love with optics and lasers as the, the m most wonderful tools that, that you can use to study anything. Um, so I took it, um, I wanted to do something more impactful uh, with lasers, and I went to the applied physics department at Stanford, uh, worked with Bob Beyer, trying to understand and, and develop new um, processes for um, material ablation um, using ultra-short pulses, femtosecond lasers. Um, so that was my second career. And then I spent some time at Harvard in Eric Mazur's lab where I, we start to use the laser, femtosecond lasers, to manipulate, ablate um, subcellular organelles. And that was the time that I realized what I want to do for my rest of my career. Um, it's, uh, I, decided, I came back to Stanford, Bob Byer asked me, write me a proposal. I wrote two pages of proposal, he gave me $10,000, and I put together my first two-photon microscope and the femtosecond laser nanosurgery setup. Uh, we walk around and find some C. elegans and started doing some uh, very interesting work applying femtosecond laser to nanosurgery. Um, since then, 10 years ago, I, I came to UT Austin and, and that's uh, as my third career. That's what uh, I have established myself, um, thinking that, um, believing that the most impactful um, application of femtosecond lasers or lasers can be in my medicine. So I will try to explain you my efforts on bringing femtosecond laser into clinic. We are not in the clinic yet. We, are, we started in vivo small animal studies. So I will take you from, um, from the process of thinking and evolution of uh, what we have been doing in the last 10 years. Um, well, femtosecond laser are the most precise tool, but the precision ablation was shown about, uh, you know, in 80s, 20, 20 or so years later than Charles Town's uh, laser invention. When IBM colleagues and they took the leftover turkey after thanks, day after Thanksgiving and brought to the lab and tried to ablate some cartilage. And they could successfully show that oh, um, they could use, if they used eczema lasers, uh, far UV, they could ablate much cleaner than the uh, YAG second harmonic 532 nanometer. And um, uh, for this um, thoughtful um, experiment, um, 30 years later, they uh, won the National 
um, um, Medal of Technology and Innovation from Obama about a few years ago. Um, because this tool has been used already for 25, more than 25 million people correcting their eye vision um, through the refractive surgery. Um, so they give their talk in, in, a, in a conference, in an important uh, large conference. Those days was enough to give one conference and you got the attention of ophthalmologists. And uh, 13 years later, um, the first um, clinical, uh, clinical trials of lasers for eye surgery was uh, accomplished. Uh, so what happens in this, uh, they used to use uh, blades to open the uh, cornea so that they can bring the laser. Uh, um, laser and uh, ablate your um, um, and uh, cause the, um, um, uh, shape your um, cornea actually. Um, however, this um, touch um, the la um, razor blades cause uh, all kinds of problems. One of them is, of course, is a trauma. It's a mechanical. Um, cutting, it can tear, it cannot be uh, very uniform, and also sterilization problem is in contact. That's when femtosecond lasers uh, came in charge after 10 years after that, and then they used by focusing the laser light underneath the, um, um, underneath the cornea, they could ablate um, um, a plane and then have, create the flap without touching it, without using the knife that enabled, uh, that reduced all the traumatic injury and all the partial section, all the problems of razor blade. And since then, millions of people are using, um, are getting, um, being treated with femtosecond LASIK. Um, in more recent years, I have to get used to this. In more recent years, um, um, Planker et al. In, at Stanford, they also successfully showed that you can use femtosecond laser to remove the, uh, the lens. Um, and then you can replace with intraocular uh, ocular, uh, lens replacement. Um, that shows that you can do more precisely uh, and, and more accurately and with more successful outcomes. So uh, we are approaching to my talk. Um, so all this application is in ophthalmology. They use this uh, big laser. Um, and the patient is li lies down and the eye is vacuumed into very precisely, bring into big microscope and do the surgery. How about if you want to uh, approach different sides of the organs, and, and um, uh, like such as vocal folds or prostate or other organs, internal organs, or independently, surgeon wants to have a flexible tool where they can go if they want to remove whatever they want to achieve. Um, uh, they want to have a probe that they can um, uh, flexibly move it around. Uh, that can be achieved using uh, fiber delivery and using endoscopic probes. Um, so to make uh, miniaturized microscopes that can attach into these fibers and deliver the laser pulses to the location that the surgeon um, wants. So this is the challenge that we started to tackle 10 years ago. Um, but before that, I want to just quickly explain you guys are all laser materials processing people. Uh, you are probably more familiar than me, but just give me a, uh, let me give you a quick uh, overview when we squeeze the um, electromagnetic wave package into very short um, time durations, we can get very high peak powers. Um, so temporal confinement uh, leads to nonlinear absorption since because of the high peak powers, the laser uh, will, oh, I have to get used to it. The laser will get only focus where the intensity is high enough in the focal plane and causing the, this special confinement. So temporal confinement leads to nonlinear absorption. Uh, that allows us spatial confinement. And we can do all this at using very small energies. We can achieve very high peak powers using very small energies. Um, we can use this laser. We don't have to tune the laser wavelength to get absorbed by the, linearly by the um, material that we are processing, because we can create our seed electrons with, through the nonlinear uh, absorption or impact ionization. Uh, basically, by creating um, um, through multiphotonization, some free electrons that later on they accelerate gain kinetic energy through inverse brand circular absorption. And once there's enough kinetic energy, they bump into one of the bound electrons, creating a quasi free 
uh, electron um, release and that gain and then so on and so forth. It's, there is an exponential increase in electron density. Once the electron density uh, reaches the um, critical density, plasma density, then we have an optical breakdown. So within 100 frames a second, you created this um, um, large number of free electrons, um, and uh, they thermalize and create this hot and dense plasma within the next tens of picoseconds. Um, at this time, there are uh, the, the hot plasma wants to expand, and with this, there are shock waves and uh, stress waves are generated. Depending how much energy you put in, the strength of the shock waves and the extent of the damage uh, will, be, um, will be confined or enlarged. Um, and then you can control it very well. You can also create electron density that is lower than the critical electron density uh, of the plasma that you generated. Uh, so low density plasma, which will not create optical breakdown, but it will, because of the thermal processes, uh, equilibrate more a bit, uh, uh, faster than the, the, the acoustic waves. So you have thermal elastic stress within the uh, first uh, tens of picosecond in this region. So this thermal elastic stress, when once it exceeds the tensile strength of the water, let's say in tissue, then you have a um, tearing and creating this nano bubbles. So you can do uh, non plasma or plasma, plasma mediated ablation, and you can really control by knowing how much energy you will need to apply. So it is uh, quite precise. You can, um, and it's very consistent. If you apply six nanojoules in this focusing conditions, you will create more or less this kind of uh, ablation. This is axons that we ablated inside a C elegant little warm uh, axon, a little warm that has a very small number of neurons. But, so you can control it very well. Uh, so all this, again, we are using nanojoules. What actually uh, needs hundreds of microjoules using nanosecond UV laser, you can do it only with um, tens of nanojoules or less. Um, so that's one of the uh, big advantages of femtosecond lasers that you can use very small energies. It's very efficient coupling of the energy through the plasma into the tissue. So most of the energy goes into ablation and not into heating of the surrounding uh, environment. So these are the main advantages of femtosecond lasers. And um, this uh, um, caricature, I like it, uh, from Clark MXR. Um, that shows the, how um, uh, you know, long pulse conventional, we call it nanosecond pulses conventional, how they um, create this heat affected zone and, and then damage to the surrounding material while femtosecond lasers, uh, everything is minimal, the heating is minimal and the damage to the surrounding minimal. I wouldn't say none, none existing but minimal. Um, so how does it look in tissue if you take a um, brain tissue, this is with the uh, you know, CO2 lasers, ablated brain tissue, and this is a slice, um, a histological slice of the tissue. You can see here the heat affected zone and the recast material and then the damage to the surrounding material. Um, and that's what, how it looks like. This is vocal fold surgery. So nowadays, CO2 lasers are using the vocal folds better than using mechanical because in the past, the just only way that they can remove cancer in the vocal folds by removing your vocal folds, uh, no eating, no, no talking, and it was very, very uh, uh, bad with the you know, uh, um, incorporation of CO2 lasers into the surgery. It's already we are doing much better than before, but you can see um, the, you know, the charring and then the, all this uh, heated, uh, heat damaged tissue. Um, you know, if you go to the surgery room, you will actually smell the barbecue smell, uh, even though it's a small, it's, it's kind of not you know, funny and not funny, but so um, with the femtosecond lasers, on the other hand, we can do it much clearly. It's clean and, um, and, and then you don't have the um, charring, and which is very important because the surgeon, the way that they see the cancer is by their eye. They look at it and they see, oh, this is a cancer region. Once it became 
um, all black, they, they, don't, they lose their um, guidance, they, they lose their diagnosis, they lose their um, uh, way of identifying the cancer cells. So they really would like to have something like this. One of the reasons that, for example, they don't use uh, lasers on the spinal cord uh, surgeries uh, because they need to see the, 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 the axon so that they don't damage your nerves. Um, and then if they have a charring like this, they cannot see anything and so they will just paralyze you while trying to remove your um, un unwanted tissue. So they don't use, uh, in that sense, um, lasers over there. So there's a really need for that. And you can see here the histology, uh, very clean. There is no heat affected zone, near, no thermal da uh, damage to the surrounding uh, the tissue. And more importantly, it can also ablate, as they did in the ophthalmology, below the tissue and, and create little pockets, which uh, I will talk about an, an, an interesting application that we, we are working on. Uh, uh, for a treatment that there is no solution yet. Um, so, so our goal is to create a flexible delivery of the femtosecond laser sources into uh, tissue sites and through endoscopes. So we want to develop um, um, miniaturized optics, fiber uh, coupled miniaturized optics, and not only surgery, combine it with using the same lasers, also you can do uh, imaging uh, through nonlinear microscopy. Um, Neonlinear microscopy endoscope has been shown uh, already for some years, but the challenge is even bigger if you want to deliver enough energies to do surgery to the fibers. And what are those challenges? Is the, the, the nonlinear effects that we take uh, um, you know, um, um, advantage of it, and now they become a limiting factor if you want to deliver them through fiber or miniaturized optics. Um, the, Nonlinear index depends on the intensity through, um, it, it depends on the intensity, both spatially and temporally. Um, so the spatial intensity distribution, as we are focusing in the tissue, spatial intensity distribution act as a lens as we create um, 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 a, a changed index of refraction of the material in the middle um, more than on the sides because intensity is higher in the middle. So it acts as a, a focusing lens and you create this self-focusing uh, problem uh, that is important and when you are delivering through the fibers as well as when you are trying to ablate deep inside the tissue, you may create self-focusing out of focus. You, you have to be careful. The temporal aspect of it uh, creates the uh, phase mage, phase, surface modulation, um, broadens the spectrum uh, uh, and then creates uh, uh, even uh, higher peak powers that can be eventually damaging. Um, and also we have to be careful through the index of fraction dependence on the wavelength and not to disperse uh, our pulses too much. So all these challenges have to be taken care of while uh, considered while delivering through the fibers as well as um, creating miniaturized optics. So we have been developing, uh, considering all these aspects, uh, um, endoscopic microscopes uh, that will be delivered through fiber. Uh, we already have published three of these um, um, endoscopes. Um, I will talk um, the general uh, idea of it through this first generation. Um, Basically, it's a, we took the big microscope and you, we squeeze it into a small microscope where um, uh, we, ha we have all the optics and everything. So, but the delivery was through fiber and you cannot deliver because of all these nonlinear effects that I mentioned to you, we cannot use normal fibers to deliver ultra short pulses. Uh, so right at the same time that I was thinking how to do it around 2003, um, it became the first commercially, it wasn't even commercially available. I was writing the proposal to NSF while it was not yet commercially available, but about to become commercially available. Photonic band gap air core fibers that they could, um, they have a, so they have a, um, the middle is air core, so you can deliver the femtosecond pulses and the non -air effects of air uh, obviously are much smaller than, than, than the glass, for example. So we use the, um, a photonic banga fibers deliver the light. We use uh, man's mirrors uh, to scan the beam. So we focus into very small spot size and we need to scan it. Uh, we use uh, relay lenses 
to uh, image the uh, uh, laser beam on the mirror on the back aperture of the lens, uh, which is our objective that focuses into the tissue. So in those times, um, um, the first uh, we had, uh, I was lucky enough to be able to purchase um, two lasers. Um, um, we had oscillator for two photon imaging, Mai Tai. And uh, I, I did have a speed fire, uh, which had amplified pulses at kilohertz repetition rate. So we got these two different laser pulses and delivered into the fiber um, a, to be able to do image, imaging, two photon imaging, as well as laser surgery. So um, for the surgery, um, Spitfire worked around 800 nanometer. So these photonic bang of fibers, they are uh, non-dispersive only in very narrow bandwidth. Um, so when we brought our 800 femtosecond pulse, uh, 800 nanometer laser pulses, um, a, okay, sorry. Uh, let's, let me just start with the imaging, I think. Um, um, that will be better. So imaging was tunable, Mai Tai. So we could tune the wavelength to the region where we don't want to have the pulse dispersion. Uh, so it was minimally dispersive around, um, around um, 760 nanometer. So really uh, what we brought in with few femtosecond, we ended up uh, uh, around, uh, again, uh, 100 uh, or 200 uh, femtosecond range. But the, for the surgery, uh, our wavelength was around 800 nanometer. So if we brought up uh, with um, around 100 frames a second, we end up with few picoseconds. Uh, we didn't want to have that. Um, and also, we wanted to take advantage. So as your pulse, uh, pulse duration increases, your ablation threshold increases. So what we did, uh, we pre chirped the pulse um, to uh, actually three picosecond anomalously, and so that the fiber shrink back uh, to uh, its original uh, diffraction limited, more or less, um, sorry, the, the transform, transform limited uh, pulse duration uh, of a uh, few hundred times a second. So we use the um, dispersion of the fiber itself as uh, taking advantage, so we could deliver up to two microjoule uh, energies into, the, into this fiber. The nice thing was that we could show, uh, these are uh, um, cancer cells in a petri dish, we could image them, these are calcium AM imaging, uh, to show that they are alive, and we could target one of them and ablate it with intensities that we could ablate these axons very small, um, and with very small energies. Um, why is it here, uh, uh, hundreds of nanojoule? I told you that we can use a couple of nanojoule before. This, this is miniaturized optics. We don't have such a high NA focusing conditions anymore. Uh, that's something that you have to also be aware of when you make endoscopic probes. You cannot have 1.4 NA or even 1 NA. So we had about uh, 0.4 NA that we could achieve in these endoscopes. Therefore, larger spot size, we had to use uh, larger energies. Um, so these were the hundreds of nanojoules, these energies that we needed. Um, so let's, uh, that was a big success. The first probe, we could show that we can deliver from uh, photonic bang of fibers into miniaturized optics, but the probe was large. The next stage was shrinking it, the probe even further. Uh, things that we had to consider uh, just quickly. The objective, the green lenses, we were using green lenses. They have a good um, lateral resolution, but axial resolution due to the spherical aberration is large. We had to, um, but it came out that there are very nice aspheric, like miniaturized aspheric lenses that we could use. Um, so um, we used the packaging, um, we used PCB board for the MEMS mirrors, the packaging shrinked. We, do, we did 3D printing so that we could align the housing that holds all this engineering work that we had to do to shrink it by 50% to below 10 millimeter. Um, and then we could come some good resolution, we could image pollen grains. These are uh, second harmonic generation of a red tail tandem and porcine vocal folds. So we could do some nice imaging as well um, with this while we reduce the volume. Um, that was great. So now we, we, we are using this Spitfire Mai Tai and we, are, we have miniaturized optics. We can deliver them from photonic Benga fiber. But uh, we are really want to go into clinic. So we need to consider some challenges 
that we, we want to overcome in the clinic. We cannot take the Spitfire into clinic. Uh, it's huge. And then might have two laser systems and so on and so forth. So this is the third um, uh, generation comes. And so the questions that we had to overcome, um, let's summarize. The, um, can we deliver large enough energies through a fiber-coupled microsurgery system, miniaturized yeah, system? <coughs> yes, we showed that. But can we do it um, using a whole system that is simple and compact? And, and do it how quickly we can do it? Can we do image guidance um, uh, for a particular application? So that's how uh, we were lucky. Radians came on board, and they told me that I can use their laser. Um, so we were using, as I was mentioning, amplified system for the surgery, Spitfire, and the oscillator, uh, MITAI for imaging, uh, combining these two pulses. Um, so by Radiance bringing a box, a small box, uh, that does both imaging and surgery, can potentially do both of them. So it, had, it didn't have um, as high repetition rate as Mai Tai, uh, for those who are familiar with ultra-fast lasers, they are 80 megahertz. So for imaging, you need high repetition rate pulses, so you can collect lots of uh, pixels in your field of view. But for surgery, you cannot bring 80 megahertz pulses because they will overlap, will create big bubble, and you don't have a control. For surgery, what you want, you want to create little plasma, expand collapse within you know, microseconds, and then you bring another one, expand collapse. So you want to use every pulse that you bring for surgery. So you cannot use 80 megahertz for in surgery for, because of that. But fiber lasers are perfect for both applications because uh, they have um, around megahertz or below uh, repetition rate, which is good for imaging, pretty good. And, and, and it is very good also for surgery. Uh, so you can bring every um, you know, um, microsecond or so a, a, a new pulse, <coughs> and they will not interact with each other. So we were lucky, very lucky to get this laser. Um, so another challenge, so we wanted to, that's where we developed the third generation endoscope. Um, uh, we use a, a radiance laser um, through the photonic bang up fiber, the same fiber we delivered. And now we wanted to make it even smaller, five millimeters, so we can use in the endoscopic probes, um, where um, with this time, instead of MEMS scanning mirrors, we use piezo, uh, vibrating the tip of the fiber so that it can be uh, scanned on the surface, uh, which has been shown before for two-photon imaging. We adapted that. Um, and again, the uh, air core when get fiber, um, and then use uh, <coughs> two aspheric lenses, commercially available, to be able to focus into small spot size. Um, so housing was uh, 3D printed again, it was aligned, and it was everything is good. But, so when we started to use the Radiance fiber laser, we didn't have as much luck as we were using the Spitfire to deliver two microjoules. Um, we couldn't chirp it back because um, uh, to start with, uh, the uh, bandwidth um, of the fi uh, fiber lasers are smaller, so you don't have so much chirping and, and then this, you know, comp compression ability through the fiber. Um, and also, uh, there were other challenges that in the beginning we didn't realize, so we were trying to deliver a lot of energy and we cooled it. So we did really a systematic study of the fiber, how, many, how much energy we can deliver through the fiber. Um, so we did uh, all kinds of NA to couple to find the best coupling condition into the fiber. Uh, this is how the pulse, duration, pulse looks like, and this, these are the fiber itself. So this is the air core of the fiber. So this is the air core, right? So this is the Gaussian beam. As the, as the beam moves slightly, um, as you can see, in the, then it, it touches the glass right there. And so a, a little movement of the um, uh, beam will cause damage on the, on the cladding of the photonic crystal. So we really uh, want to align it very well. But there is no way that you can align it very well. It's a six mic micron mode field diameter. It's very small. And the output energy doesn't change by misalignment in the x, y, and the z directions a little bit. So there is no way that you can get a feedback on knowing where you are, uh, you're, you're, you're coupling the light 
exactly into the core, so there may be some changes. Um, and then it came out that fiber laser, uh, that particular one that we were working, um, had a, a less beam instability than speed fire. Uh, so there were beam fluctuations, pointing vector fluctuations. Very small, microradians, uh, milliradians, I do not remember at the moment, but quite small. However, uh, it was enough when you are trying to f uh, couple your light into six micron core, it's enough to reduce your energy that you can deliver because it will fluctuate and it will cause damage on the surroundings. So actually, um, these are the um, energies that we could couple into. And if we didn't have beam instability, we could couple double the energy. So we really wanted to understand how much energy we can couple reliably into these fibers. The last thing that you want to have in the surgery room while you are doing surgery, the, the laser, you know, the, your fiber is burned. Um, and actually, I was talking to one of the uh, surgeons, and this is the, um, uh, one of the reasons that they tried one laser. Uh, I will not give a name. Uh, and, and then they were delivering with the fiber. It, actually, the fiber is, was the, um, the, the product they were trying to test, and it just got burned. And they didn't want to hear about this fiber anymore, even though it's quite good, and they improved it a lot nowadays for different fiber and different laser. So we really have to, when we give to the doctor something to try for the first time, we want to have something reliable. So that's what we try to study and understand. Uh, nevertheless, we could deliver enough energy to ablate tissue for the first time, and it was uh, quite good and encouraging. Uh, and then we can do it very fast. In 50 millisecond time, you can ablate a 100 micron field of view. So now the doctor can have a painter of 100 micron Spot, even though you have micron resolution spot size, but it's ablating so fast that you are, it's covering about 100, 120 micron field of view, so it has a paint, or she has a paint to cut wherever they want quite fast. So with this work, we could show that um, you can use fiber lasers, you can do um, very fast, rapid uh, surgeries and deliver enough energies to ablate tissue. Uh, so summarized for that part of the work, um, yes, we can um, use uh, uh, fiber-coupled um, uh, microscopes and, and use uh, simple and compact fiber lasers, high repetition rate, to be able to do the surgeries. And can we ablate quickly? Yes, with 300 kilohertz, you can ablate quite fast uh, for a particular application that I will talk in a minute. Uh, we can do it as fast as the doctors wish to. Uh, can we have image guidance? Let me take you through uh, an application um, for that. So, to be able to bring clinical, um, uh, to, to do this laser into clinic, you really need to get into, um, a, find a treatment that doesn't have a solution. It's very hard to replace something that exists. You will say, oh, it's doing better, but it's better to say, I'm giving you a tool that you cannot do. It. You can you can treat something that you cannot treat otherwise. So that's the only way that probably I, am, I believe that only way to get into the clinic and and convince the doctors and uh, hospitals to purchase uh, these uh, light sources and surgical tools. So the application that we targeted it was uh, with the collaboration in Harvard Medical School, uh, uh, Professor Zaitals, who treats actually the vocal faults of many singers, uh, most recently uh, singer Adele. Uh, uh, he does uh, perform all the surgeries. So we came up with this uh, um, um, a, a treatment tool that if, when there's a scarred vocal folds, either from giving too many plenary talks and then your voice starts getting uh, coarse or you had uh, some illness before, like a cancer, and so you created a scar, there's no treatment. They want to inject biomaterials into this scar tissues, but they cannot because the scar rejects it. Um, so what we want to do is uh, ablate a plane underneath the tissue where uh, you can uh, localize, sorry, my voice changes as I move my head, um, you can inject the biomaterial and localize underneath the tissue and separate the scar tissue from the epithelial that moves so you can uh, recover your pliability. Um, so that's the, the challenge. We did some tabletop studies where you can use second harmonic to image and then you can create ablation and you create these bubbles. Um, so if you look at the histology, you can see very nice uh, cuts without thermal damage. And more recently, we kind of injected inside this tissue um, 
some biogels and localize them very nicely. Um, I will not go, uh, this is actually have in vivo uh, surgery we injected. Um, uh, you can see the injected material right here. And then you can see these are blood vessels. And then you turn on the fluorescence, actually you can see in the animal localized uh, biomaterial. Um, and then you can also image the biomaterial with uh, third harm uh, with second harmonic imaging, and then the red is the gel that injected below the tissue. So all good. Um, we can use second harmonic to be able to image, but can we image as deep as we ablate? It came out that it's a limitation. We did some work. I will not go into too much onto that. I will just want to deliver a message. Uh, we were using with the two photons, you have a limitation of how deep you can, you can go, because as you go deeper, out, you have to crank your power because of the light scatters in the tissue. Then you start collecting, uh, as the power goes up, out of focus, close to the surface, you start creating lots of fluorescence. So this fluorescence, when this fluorescence level equals to the fluorescence you get from the focal plane, then you start losing your contrast, and that's, you are limited. Um, the same radiance fiber, um, actually the fundamental wavelength is 1550, so we decided to use it to do third harmonic um, generation microscopy. With three photons, the out of focus nonlinear absorption probability goes down, so you can go deeper, and the longer wavelengths have less scattering, so you can go deeper. And indeed, uh, let me just show you this movie. Um, oh, okay, here. Oh, you go too fast. Okay, now we should. So now we are imaging. One of them is second harmonic this side, and then these are the collagen fibers inside the epithelial well. You want to do the surgery, and this is the third harmonic generation at 1550. And uh, it's, as you can see, this we don't see anymore. It, everything is noise in the second harmonic and two photon, while the third harmonic can go deeper and deeper and still image as deep as we can ablate. So that was very encouraging. So our goal is. Um, these are all calculations that really fits. Our goal is now to combine the third harmonic generation imaging with the surgery probe to be able to do ablation and, and cut deep and do, um, um, do the uh, target the location that you are interested. Um, uh, so yes, ter third harmonic. So just so let me mention you remaining critical questions that we are uh, kind of addressing partial and it has to be addressed in the future. Um, so we need to get robust ablations. We don't want to give any surgeons anything that works sometimes or not. So we want to have ideally all fiber lasers or robust lasers. That, so for example, we are using the <coughs> second harmonic generation of 1550. Um, you know, crystals and they are outside, coupled, maybe everything can be more robustly organized. So, we, so basically the doctors, what they want to do, put their laser and on the table, on a cart, and move it from surgery room to surgery room. Um, a so robust fiber coupling. So we saw that this air core banga fibers, they are very small. Uh, new generation of fibers, uh, some of you may be familiar, came out just recently. And lucky enough, we got to collaborate with them again as uh, one of the first people uh, doing uh, laser surgery. So these are Kagome fibers. Um, and um, um, we have been developing the next generation surgical probe using their probe. So what is unique in this probe, instead of having six micron uh, core, now we have 31 micron still that you can deliver single mode, uh, which is amazing. And you can deliver tens of microjoules of energy in air coupling, which is also amazing. That's exactly the energy type of energy that you need for surgery. Um, and they have a broadband uh, non-dispersive transmission and they are non-dispersive broadband so we can deliver both 770 and 1550 to do the third harmonic imaging so really a dream fiber came through um, but with dream comes challenges um, so since it's a large core is low NA you cannot use off-the-shelf lenses that we have been so far using so we had to develop our own lens systems um, but that's also challenging because you get from point O to NA and you are focusing to point two NA. So you need to use special materials like a zinc sulfide. It came out that they have nonlinear effects, so we couldn't deliver the energies 
Um, so we have to change the material to calcium fluoride. And we recently developed this uh, lens system also. Um, so um, we have been doing some, uh, started doing some in vivo work with this new generation probe. Um, so with this precision, you need to also, so now your depth is very small. So you, you want to be, you, you cannot anymore do like, like, you know, you need to be more precise. I think what we need to do, corp incorporate robotics if you want to take advantage of these lasers. Um, can we ablate bulk tissue? Yes, I mean, you want to do that, I don't know, but you can ablate few millimeter cubes per minute. This is not large areas, and this is not the job of femtosecond lasers. You can do it with other lasers if you want to ablate bulk. But if you want to clean, or you want to cut around the bulk even, so you can do that with very high precision. Uh, so for example, if it's one centimeter long, one millimeter incision, you can do in one minute. So you can go around, um, around the box if you want to do or clean the environment. Um, there are other challenges for those of you that uh, who are developing lasers. Um, for the vocal folds that the application uh, that I was mentioning or other, many other application in the, um, uh, you know, in, uh, in skin and uh, 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 remodeling, for example, uh, you want to go deep in the tissue. We are limited how deep you can go because of the out-of-focus self-focusing. Um, so we can go five, six scattering lengths, which is for skin, this is about 150 micro, no more than this. You start, or 200 micro, you start getting damage out of focus also. Uh, so you want to go to longer wavelengths. Uh, we have been, uh, we tried uh, one of Imra's laser, even 10, 30 nanometer, that already enabled, you know, 250, 300 micron deep ablation. If we can go even a longer wavelengths, we can go uh, hopefully uh, a bit deeper in the skin. In brain, you can go deeper because brain scatters less. Um, we are trying other things such as optical clearing um, uh, so that you reduce the scattering match uh, uh, the index of fraction between different organelles in your, in your tissue so that you can go deeper, reduce scattering. Uh, these are the things that we are trying and then these are the challenges we, we still need to overcome. So I can see that the future there will be handheld ultra-fast lasers com controlled by a computer delivered by the fiber into endoscopic probe that the surgeon can use into clinic either handheld or through endoscopic probes. Um, and Hopefully, the nurse will pass the phantom laser eventually to the doctor. Uh, with this, I would like to conclude, and just uh, this is my current team and the collaborators. Um, and this is my other research group, microfluidics group, that um, uh, doing other work. Uh, these are my funding agencies for this particular work, NSF and CIPRI Texas. Texas put aside $3 billion for cancer research uh, to be spent in the uh, 10, 10 years, still very competitive, 8% uh, success rate, even though it's uh, Texas and nowadays funding is very difficult, but it's a great resource for us. And uh, well, I would like to thank you for your listening.